First Spin. Welcome to First Spin, a show where I learn about how to use the parallax propeller without having any prior programming experience. Rather than do this on my own, I have enlisted the help of two experts. Hi, guys. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, So before each show, we uh, go through my code, and then we look to see... um, How badly she messed it up. Right. And apparently... (laughs) Apparently, uh, this week's stuff, I pretty much mirrored last week's. She learned nothing, people. Well. Nothing. She thought she got it, but she didn't. I'll Not, sh- and we'll show you guys On other the shows, code. you know, we might cheat ahead of the time and say, okay, Addy, you're going to have to redo this right so that you look like you learned something from last episode. But instead, because we're hard-nosed Punks. Terrible, terrible people. Yeah. Roy and I are actually going to do this live. Eddie, what? you didn't do your well, homework assignment. Well, well the, the other thing, though, is that it may be that Addie wasn't the only one that didn't get it. Like, maybe some of the listeners out there didn't quite get it either. Perhaps. So, so maybe right. further explanation so that Addie gets it will help other people. So just to let you guys know, what I ended up making was a calculator, essentially. And it has the functionality for you to put two numbers in and then the operation so plus minus multiply divide and then you get the the number and it works uh but again it's, it's based on the fact that a is next to b <laughs> is next to t- o the operation so everything in memory is has to, to be t. exact Right. It's it, very similar to the last thing you did with the crazy command where everything has to be all set up ahead of time exactly right and then it'll all work. And right. that's the exact and, kind of thing that you need to avoid when designing interpretive systems. Right. And not just interpreters, but higher level stuff too. Okay. So we're working from uh, the byte byte calculator thing and... Roy, I believe you just told me that after, so A. So, so let's let's start with a basic concept that I think maybe you just don't quite understand and hopefully it will help other people, which is the idea of a register. Okay. Um, so in the current byte byte system that most of us are familiar with, uh, we have the memory addresses. Mm-hmm. It's an array of 256 possible memory addresses. And then the memp thing pointing at it. Right. And we have the same thing for the program with the exe section and then the exe p pointer pointing at it. Um, so what the registers we were talking about last week, the A, B, and C, mm-hmm. are kind of like another memory section, specially named. Instead of being an array of variables that are, you know, an array of mem with a pointer into it, it's named slots. Each address is named. Mm -hmm. So we have A and it's a long or a byte in this case, right? And then we have B and it's a byte. And they're independent of each other, but you can operate on them with commands. Right. And so that's the, because you were just treating them as local variables. And and that works in the case with spin, but the idea is the concept that they are a memory slot that the execution uh, thing can operate on. Okay. They're not just a local variable inside of one of the case statement, you know, handlers. Okay. It's uh, so when you want to use them, you need to treat them like they're part of the system overall. Okay. So the way you use them in the current revision of stuff where you have an A and a B variable um, is that you just have a local variable inside there and you use them inside the S command and there's no way to access them in any other way. Mm -hmm. But what you really want is a way to use them and access them with commands. Okay. Because that makes them more generally useful. Okay. Um, And I I just wanted to explain that in a way that 
hopefully it was a little more clear and simple to kind of grok. Okay. Hopefully that helped you at all, maybe? Mm, I mean, I kind of, yeah, I kind of get it. Like, you just want them accessible from outside so like, programs. Right... Well, like like right now, you use the equals command to type a number and then have it get stuck in the current memory address. Right. And that makes it so that you can put things in memory and then do things with them. Right. So when you want to put something in a register, you need a command to be able to put something in that register. You don't want to just have it be automatically putting something there because of some side effect of another command. Yeah, right? okay. You want to... You want to directly control what goes into the register. Right. That makes it a little more general, generally useful. Um, the other thing is going the other way. Eventually, we're going to want commands that can take a register value and write it back out to memory. Right. Sure. That's what C is supposed to do. So A is an instruction that is supposed to put whatever mem uh, value in whatever memory address you're pointing at with an MP, into register A. So it's equal. So in the program, it'd be equals and then A. So equals, well, which is u user input, and then... No. What? No, no, no. No user no. input. How is there so no the, user input? So, so Your just... program takes input from the user. And but that's user input. It takes right, but, it and but... puts it in memory. And right. then skipped, from memory, skipped... you put it into the register. Right, I understand that. ahead a little bit, though. Well, we're we're still talking about what you owe to implement in the byte byte interpreter, not what you write in the end result program. Oh, well, okay. So then, in the interpreter, I have a col a in quotes as the, one of the cases colon, right. and then I set the local variable a to equal mem mem p. Right. Right. That's exactly all you need in right. the a one, and then you need one for b. Right, which I just Same which I've written b. right. Okay. Okay, and then C reads whatever is in the C register and puts it into whatever spot in memory you're pointing at. Puts whatever... what? It so takes whatever value is in register C and puts it into whichever memory slot you're pointing at. So... So... C is your output, and A and B are your inputs in this case. Okay. We're doing a simplified version of registers. Very simplified. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so A, B, and C. Understand what all three of those are to do. Sure, but although I don't really exactly know how to write C. I mean, because C kind of depends is, on what is, A and B are doing, right? No, but, but C is just the, the command C. All it does is take the value that's in C and write it out to memory. That's so it's it. almost exactly the same as A and B. It's just the opposite direction. So instead of C equals mem mem p, it's mem mem p equals C. So you're just okay. writing out the result from C into memory. Okay, sure. I get that. So Does it make a all... difference what, what order they're in, by the way? In the oh. case? No. No. Okay, so I could have done C equals mem mem p. No, that, that goes the other way. That assigns the memory to the register. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So well, that but what, so that's what I mean. Like that order does matter. Yes. Then. That order matters, yeah. Because right. that's All right. which direction you're copying the value from and to. So the commands A and B copy values out of memory into the registers. Right. And C copies the value out of the register into memory. Okay. Okay. Now the next set of commands. Plus sign. Yep. Minus sign. Yep. Forward slash and asterisk. Yep. And so all we of had these a are plus sign and a minus sign before. Those have been replaced with I and D for increment and decrement. And that frees up the plus sign and the minus sign right. for use here. Right. Right. Okay, so then the plus sign, I mean... It adds so, whatever is in register A to whatever is in register B and puts the result in register C. So it's really simple. C colon equals A plus B. Colon equals A plus. But then um, when do you put the, the plus sign? Or is that a character? 
So after you've loaded A and B with your two values that you want, you can put the plus sign in and it will do the operation of A plus B and store the result in C. Then oh, so this. this is this is like a neutered calculator. Well, no, we're we, we're going to implement all four of them. You'll be able to do all four. Mm, but yeah, you will be able to do all four, but you, but the user can't determine what it is. You can write your code so that the user can pick which operation is used, which instruction is used. But it doesn't see it as an instruction necessarily. It sees it as a character. You are, in the way that you're doing it right now, you're essentially allowing the user to inject code into the program through user input, which is bad. Yeah, yeah self-modifying code from user input. I don't understand. Not a good. How am I in right, letting them Right, you don't understand. It's really, really bad. But how am I letting them inject? Because when, when they type... In your program, you have them typing the plus, minus, right. star, or slash. Right. And that is going into the execution of the S command. Yeah. Now here, you're kind of trapping it in a nested case statement. But imagine if you weren't trapping it. Imagine if you were just injecting whatever they had typed directly into the executable array and then executing whatever byte they put there. They could put anything. They could put, uh, but it's not. It's not decrement covered. the memory pointer down, and then you know your entire program would get borked. But it's not running anything. It's only running right because you trapped right. it inside of a nested case statement. It's not as dangerous. But if you were directly injecting this executable input that they've been giving you into the executable memory, just imagine the chaos that could happen. You always right. avoid that kind of situation. Huh. And and the other thing is if they didn't type plus minus star divide at all, then your program would not work right because it would just write out whatever is in T. It wouldn't write anything out. It would write out what's in T. No, because it, it's contingent on S having been done. No, if, if, S you, if F... you did an S and they hadn't done they hadn't typed a plus minus star or slash when you asked them to type a command. Oh, it would have keep kept going. I see. It, well, no, it would have run and it just wouldn't have done the math operation with a and B. It would have just written out whatever it was in T. But that's because if I, that's because I didn't add an error trap though. Right. You shouldn't be adding error traps to the inside of an interpretive system. Well, okay. So the error traps happen in the code that's being interpreted not in the interpreter itself. The interpreter needs to be like a bicycle. There's no error trap on the bicycle. The error trap is in, you know, the person using it to balance the program. Hmm. Okay, so then the so then the program, the eventual program that I would write would be equals a equal I could do just equals b and then yeah. Equals A equals B would assign two numbers into A and B. Right. And then and then A plus. And it would do the math and store the result in C. For then an addition. Do, then you could do a C, which would write the result back out to memory. And then you could print out the memory address that you're currently pointing. Right. So at this at this iteration of your version of byte byte with just those commands that you just added, you can do it so that it's still just addition. And it's all hard coded and it'll accept the input. Mm -hmm. The thing that we should talk about is the next command that you're going to add to this thing is going to be something that's a much more powerful user input that allows you to uh, let the program easily make choices according to user input because that's what you're wanting to do. You're wanting to allow them to choose what type of math operation they want to do. Right. And there's no easy way to do that with byte byte as it stands. So that's the sort of thing where you would add an instruction that creates that ability, you know, the ease of being able to make choices. Right. Instead of writing it as a special case for this particular calculator program. You want to make it as general as you possibly can so that it's useful for every program that's ever written in the language. Which but should for, be zero. Right... Do not use this language, people. Fisker <laughs> does not condone the use of byte byte. 
Wait, so... But, but for the first iteration, adding the A, B, and C commands and then the four math operations, mm -hmm. that's a pretty significant change to byte byte. Yeah. And and allows it to do a bunch of different stuff that it didn't used to be able to do. I suppose. Um, and just doing that and having that work is a good step. And then, like I said, like Whisker said, adding a command that allows you to do the choice thing that you want is the next step. But that's kind of what I did with S, right? Right, but you did it in a special case way that will only work in the context, right? Of that specific program, and that's the exact sort of thing that you need to steer away from. So what if I... Because you're not writing a system to do just to solve just one problem. You're writing a system that can solve any problem. Yeah, see, that's the problem. Daddy keeps trying to jump ahead and do something much more complicated instead of taking but it the works. steps. <laughs> it works, but it works. You came up with something clever, you... and it exposed some other issues too. You know, the user input executable code problem. That's that's a good thing to expose, and we probably would never have thought to bring it up. So, it's good that you did that. Huzzah! Just don't do it. <laughs> Alpha again. testing at its best. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay so so what are your ideas Addy? i mean you you you, you got a system where you want to make it so that it can do addition multiplication subtraction whatever the user wants it to do but you don't have a way to easily accept the input from them and make a decision based on that input you can do it with byte byte as is i think but you wouldn't want to because oh man would that be painful it would like use up all the executable memory, I think. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's it's technically possible, I think, to do it. We'll we'll ask Red and see if he can find a way. <laughs> I don't understand. He likes puzzles. No, but I don't understand. Like, it seems like it'd be really easy to just write a write a piece of, you know, a command that allows the person to choose. Oh yeah, that's what we're trying to say. Is that the way to do it is to add a command to make it easier. Right. But. But it is possible without adding that command to do it in the byte byte. Well, that just sounds like hell on earth. So yes, well, that's what that's I said. Where... Now that Addy's <laughs> caught up, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> that was what byte byte was, you know, two weeks ago or four weeks ago or whatever it was when it first started. It was hell on earth, and we're right. we're making it little baby steps out of hell towards not hell. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, I mean, can I still use S like? Well, what what we what character you use is not really important here. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand that. <laughs> you can use. Dang it! I wanted to use X. Or use. Carrot or <laughs> whatever. Right? Just some. Dag nabbit. <laughs> what you need to do is figure out what does that command need to do to make it possible for the user to make a choice. But that's not special case towards the specific calculator that can do plus, minus, divide, and multiply. But that's kind of what you would want your calculator to do. So well, I'm a yeah, little but, confused but, as to... But it's what you want your calculator to do, but that's your end result program. Byte byte needs to not be specially designed commands for a specific end user program. And that's the core thing that we're trying to get in your head, is don't write your code so that it just does one job when you can write things that can be far more powerful, right? right? With just a little tweak here and there of how you think about it, you've you could have solved one problem, instead you've created a tool that you can reuse again and again in the future. So so as a, you know, spark possibly is you know, you want the user to give you some kind of input and you want that to choose something to do. Right. Right? Right. So you want a command that does something like that. But the choosing what to do should be something that fits into the existing byte byte language as far as, uh, you know, moving around the memory or the execution or, or manipulating registers. So you don't want to just have it ask them what math operation to do and do that math operation. So the first step of this is obviously getting the user input. Guess what? You don't need to create a command to do that. You already have one. Mm -hmm. What is it? Right. 
underscore. Well, f- a character or a decimal? Character. Underscore. Underscore. Right. So you've got an underscore. That works fine. So you don't need to do that. That'll load any character off the keyboard that they press right. into memory. Right. And you can make decisions based off whatever they put in. Right. Okay, if you look at the number pad on your keyboard, and I mentioned this to Addy earlier, it's it's upside down from what's on your telephone. If that hurts your brain, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you look at the one on your keyboard, there's a, you know, uh, forward slash, uh, asterisk, a minus sign, a plus sign right there. Mm-hmm. So those are the four we're going to stick with. We're going to assume that those are the ones they're going to enter. Mm-hmm. But Byte Byte can assume that those are the ones that they're going to enter. Byte Byte needs to say, okay, it could be anything between 0 and 255. Mm-hmm. Because right. those are the memory you know, slots, what they can hold. Mm -hmm. So the command itself is going to make no assumption other than that. Mm -hmm. Zero to 255. Mm -hmm. And we already have that. We have an underscore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you're missing is the part where you make the decision, the step two. Like you give them which choice? You gave them a choice. You gave the user a choice. You said... Nine, and then they put in a plus, and then they put in a one. Okay, you visually printed that choice out to them with your program. In the code itself, which is what we actually care about, Mm -hmm. you basically just got a plus sign that's now sitting in memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got a value of nine, you've got a plus sign, which is just another value. In ACII, right? It's mm-hmm. just another number. And a one. Okay? You load the nine into register A, you load the one into register B, and now you need to make a decision on that plus sign on what to do next. Okay. So this is the challenge. What are you going to add to the command set? Something that's completely general purpose and not specific, and we can't hammer this home enough. General purpose, non-specific. What can you add as a command that'll help you jump between multiple points of logic to do different things? For your calculator, you've got four different choices. Probably five because you're going to want error trap. Okay. Maybe they put in forward slash. Maybe they put in an asterisk. Maybe they put in a minus sign. Maybe they put in a plus sign. Okay. See, you want some sort of construct that's going to allow you in one command to either jump to one place or to a different place, depending on what is in memory compared to some sort of uh, thing to compare it to. A register might be good for that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Wait, you want to put the character into a register? Or you, you want to make you, you the know character what four characters and... you're looking for, right? Yes. Uh, but they're going to be different for every program. So the command that you're going to want to create is something where you can hand it the thing to compare to, right? Before you do the comparison, you give it the thing that you're going to compare to. Okay, yes, sure. A truth test statement here. Uh, I don't know. Let's call it... So you've got registers A, B, and C? Yes. What if you had another register that you could load in something and it just sits there and you can compare whatever's in memory to this and you get one behavior if it's the same and a different behavior if it's different? I mean... Process that in your brain. Wrap your head around it. (laughs) So, two commands here. One, that puts something from your program into this register, and that's going to be used to compare against. And you're probably going to get this from your your, uh, memory loading stuff. I mean, it'll look like A, B, and C, or A and B. But it'll be yes. The the interpreter care. code itself is very simple for this. I don't know. I'll I'm, call that's it, not what I'm explaining to you. I'll call that's it. That's easy. I don't know. It doesn't matter what you Z. call it. I'll call it Z for zany. You'll change it before next week anyway. Probably. So <laughs> if you were to take 
in your, you know, in the part of your loader where you're loading up the defaults into memory. Yeah. You would, in one of those bytes, you'd be putting the thing you're comparing against in there. Okay. So your program, as it's moving through and doing all of its initialization stuff, would load in the thing that it's comparing against up into that register. And then you have a conditional jump, right? Kind of like how our uh, our brackets work. Mm -hmm. If it's mm -hmm. zero, it does one thing. If it's not zero, it does something else. Mm -hmm. If it's equal to whatever's in the register, if it's the same as whatever's in the register, it does one thing. If it's not, it does something else. Right. Right? Just a simple if-then. Exactly. I... And all <laughs> if-thens... But that sounds like error, and all, error trapping to me. And all case stuff is based on this basic logic. Yes, I understand that. Do you? I you made, don't sound like you understand I it. made a case within a case that does exactly not this. Not in spin, in byte byte. This is in byte byte. No, it's not. You wrote spin code to implement your command all as one byte byte code. What we're trying to get you to implement is some byte byte commands that would allow you to implement what you want in byte byte without having to special case it in spin ahead of time. And very easily, not the super painful way. Don't get me wrong, it's still super painful, but not like <laughs> it was like four episodes ago painful. <clears throat> right. Uh, so, all right, let's do Z as the register that that your character gets written into, which will be compared against, right? I would use like a tilde, oh. personally. Poo Because you know that in shorthand, it means, you know. Nothing. Is it close to this? All right, so tilde colon equals mem mem p, right? Which is the character that you've entered in, right? No, because it's not the character that the user typed in that you're putting in there. It's a predetermined character that you want to compare what the user put in. So you're going to put in your program, you're going to have a plus somewhere in memory, and you're going to load it into this register so that you can compare the register value, which will be your plus in the first comparison, with what they typed. This is the third and time in 10 minutes we've mentioned this. And if they are the same, then you're going to do the plus. And if they're different, you're going to skip over that and you're going to go to the next comparison, which is going to load up the register with the minus and compare it with what they typed. Do you follow? The tilde is going to load up the minus? And you're, yes, because so the idea is that you will tell it what to load. You will give it something to load to be the comparison. Okay, look at your host program. You're putting stuff in memory. Okay? So one if, of the things you're putting if, in memory are a slash, a star, a minus sign, and a plus sign. Yes. And in your byte byte program, you'll be using the tilde when pointing at those addresses in memory to load those four things up into the comparison register. So tilde will equal plus. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> tilde is a command in byte byte that will load up the memory address currently pointed to into the comparison register. Then there'll be another command. Uh, I don't know what C for comparison, right? that will take whatever happens to be in the comparison register and compare it to the current memory pointer and see if they're the same. So you're gonna obviously have to do some memory pointer adjustment in between the two commands so that you can do the appropriate comparison of the predetermined characters that you want to compare against with what the user typed. Okay. Another another way to do this, which might be a little easier to implement, is to have two commands for comparison loading, which is one will load the half, one half of the comparison from memory, which will be what they typed, 
And then the second one will load the second half of the comparison, which is your predetermined character that you want to test against. And then the third command would be to do the actual comparison and either execute the next command or skip over it or however you want to do your jump to two different places. Huh. Which is basically what I just said. Yeah. I still think my case statement works the best. That's spin. The the problem with your case statement is that it's in the context of byte byte, it's all special case and it's completely useless for any other operations. No, I changed it. I changed it to where the case mem mem p, right, which is what the user inputs. I I don't know. I will have to figure it out. I'm gonna have to re-listen to it because apparently you guys have been repeating yourselves four or five times and yes. I'm yes. <laughs> okay, I mean you want me to load up what the the user put in and you want me to load up the predefined definitions of plus, minus, multiply, and then compare these two. But, if they but are the same right, right, but one at but a one time. At a t- right. So it's if then or it's a case statement. Right. And and but the key thing is that you're loading up the values from memory that you're going to compare against. You're not predetermining in the spin code that I'm going to compare what they typed with plus. You're you're allowing the byte byte program to decide what to compare with what so that it's a general case of the comparison. It's not specially designed for you know, the calculator program to do the plus minus divide. Oh, so like if eventually I want to be able to compare whether or not A and A are equal or B and B are equal or... Right, if you, whatever they type. Whatever they type. You could ask them... So then I'll have it... So then I'll have to have it run through all 255 characters to compare. No, you you would load into memory the things that you want to compare to what they type. You preload it as part of the program into the memory addresses that are predetermined. It's like another DAT section? No, it's just in the memory, like, you know, how you can load the program in. You can also load the memory with some values ahead of time. Yes. So you would load the memory ahead of time with the characters that you want to compare against. Okay. So and that's why you you're saying it's those. generalized because... It's more generalized because then I could write a program that didn't use plus minus right. asterisk I or could, divide. for example, write a program that takes some user input, puts it in this memory address, and then loads it up into the comparison register and then asks for more user input and gets a second one and puts it in memory and then compares those two things together and makes a decision. So, like, you know, please retype your password to verify... Hmm. I could make sure that it was the same thing both times. Right. Okay, I think I get it a little bit more. Much, much, much more powerful because it's essentially implementing an if. You're just opening it up so that all symbols can be used. Right. So anything that you can put into memory could be something you can compare against. You can compare against, provided you set the definitions for it in your memory addresses. You could, right. or you can do it on the fly through user input. It's no longer specific. You know, it just does what it does. One of the commands loads something out of memory into the comparison register. The other one makes it, you know, a decision based on what you're pointing at versus what you're comparing it to. Two very, very simple commands, but together they become very powerful. Those sound like much more complex commands. They're very, very simple to implement. They're, they're, they're really very simple. Really? They're they're very very powerful concepts because they allow you to do a whole lot of stuff in your end result program. And they'll be a, the, able to do a heck of a lot more than enabled you to write a calculator. They'll enable you to do things like write submodules and stuff like that. Huh. Like you could have pre programmed in, you know, your name into the memory and then you could say type your name and they would type their name and if it matched your name then you could say oh hi you know or whatever you could allow them in access granted if they type some other name you could say access denied and exit mm. because it could compare the name 
But the... Because it's a string, you know, it's any comparison. Okay, and but a lot of this would be program side. I mean, you have the obvious right. assigning of the registers in byte byte, but the rest of it's program side in terms of... Well, it could be program side, or you could have the program when it first starts up, ask them, hey, type your name, and it will put it in memory. And then it'll go into its main operation and ask, you know, type your name now or or whatever, like some point later go, okay, type your name. And if you type the same name, then it go, okay, I, I remember you, you're so-and-so, right? Otherwise, oh, you're somebody different now, and it could start over. It doesn't have to be what what it's comparing against can be pre-programmed ahead of time, or it could be something that you that you said on the fly, like your name. That you said on the fly as you're programming. I see. You know, as part of your byte byte code. I see. It works right out of the you know the RAM. So anything that can act on RAM can act on how this thing behaves. And that's the exact sort of thing that we're trying to get through to you. That instructions, you know, to be powerful enough to be even considered to be included as an instruction, it needs to have that sort of, you know, uh, oomph. Well, then I also, th then I think that the plus minus multiply and division that we have so far, the C equals A plus B, feels constricted. Right. It, those are simple versions of those commands. In the future, when we have more powerful register manipulation stuff, then maybe you would implement a more complicated version of them that allowed you to specify what things to add to each other. Mm. Right? Mm. That's when you when you get into more advanced uh, uh, interpreters that don't have a single byte as their command, mm -hmm. but instead have multiple bytes mm -hmm. as their command, then that's one of the things that you add is the one byte tells you what the command's going to do, like add, and then the next byte will choose what it's going to add, right? Mm -hmm. It might be two register choices or it might be a memory address, it might, you know, there's it's it's an added complication that we haven't gotten to yet in the current byte byte implementation because we want to get you through these first steps of basically adding useful commands that are general to the existing thing. Eventually, you know, some weeks from now, we'll get to the point where we have a multi byte command, and then you'll be able to do what you're thinking about right now, which is the more the more general case version of add or subtract. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because right now it's still kind of bulky. Yeah, and the uh, the way that the add and subtract instructions that we talked about during this episode works is uh, strictly by value. You know, there's by value, there's by reference, and then there's by pointer. So right. you know, you could be approaching them at least in those three different ways. Um, mm -hmm. But you need because we only have one character, you need to have three addition commands. Come You'd have to have three subtraction commands, etc. Mm. Right. But that's why, like I said, typically when you get to that level of of complexity in your interpreter, you tend to have a multi-byte setup or or at least a, you know, optional second or third byte that allow you to do more complicated stuff. All right. Anyway, we're a little bit over time. We got to stop. Um, we're probably going to keep talking about this for a minute after the show. But um, thank you, everyone out there, for listening. We really appreciate it, and we hope you guys appreciate what we're doing, too. You know, we do it for yeah. you guys. Uh, so you guys can find this show every uh, Tuesday at firstspin.tv. There's an RSS feed there. If you want to automatically get it downloaded to your uh, phone, your uh, podcatcher, iTunes, whatever. And uh, you can also listen to it right on the page. That's it for us for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. See ya.